welcome students today we are going to discuss the topic epidemiology of poliomyelitis so let's see we will be covering this topic under the following headings introduction problem statement epidemiology diagnosis and lab testing for polio polio eradication and end game strategy and lastly the AFP surveillance. Poliomyelitis is an acute viral infection caused by the RNA virus. This RNA virus belongs to the Picorna viridae family and is one of the smallest known viruses. Poliomyelitis, often called as polio or infantile paralysis, it mainly affects the grey matter. Myelitis is the inflammation of the spinal cord. This was first described by Michael Underwood in the year 1789. It's a unique infection because the primarily the infection is of the human elementary tract. The small intestines are affected, are infected, but the serious manifestations are seen on the central nervous or rather the uh, peripheral nervous system causing paralysis of muscles. Now the problem statement. Polio in the pre-vaccination era, it was present worldwide. Cases were reported from all the different countries. In 1988, World Health Assembly resolved to eradicate polio globally. In 1988, it was endemic in 125 countries and by the time we reached 2008, it was reduced or limited to only four countries that is India, Pakistan, Afghanistan and Nigeria. Since February 2012, India has been declared polio free. Since the launch of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative in 1988, the global incidence of polio cases has decreased by over 99% from an estimated 3,50,000 cases to 26 reported cases in 2015. In 2015, only three countries, Afghanistan, 8 cases, Pakistan, 15 cases, and Nigeria, 4 cases, only these three countries showed active transmission of the virus. If we are not able to eradicate polio from these three countries, it could result in as many as 2 lakh new cases every year within the next 10 years. And that is very threatening, alarming situation. Hence, it's very necessary that we eradicate polio from these three countries. All these countries are reporting cases of type 1 wild polio virus. As you see this fact sheet which has been downloaded from the WHO website, you will find that in the year 2017 that Pakistan had uh, 5 cases, Afghanistan 6 cases, the total were 11. So there are no reported cases from Nigeria or any other country. So the total cases remain only 11. Now let's take a look at the Indian scenario. In 1978, the vaccination against polio was started and the polio vaccine was included in the extended program of immunization. In 1995, we began the pulse polio immunization where the, all the children under five years of age were given this vaccine during the, is given the vaccine at the same time. That is the meaning of Pulse, pulse polio. In 2009, India had half the number of cases of the total in the world. Then, by the year 2011, India brought polio infections to the zero level. That is, the number of new cases of wild polio transmission had become zero. And the last reported polio case was a two-year-old girl, Ruxar, in Howrah district, West Bengal. In 2011, that was the last case. 
in, in 2012 india was really removed from the list of polio endemic countries and in 2014 the entire region was declared polio free after india reported nil cases for 3 years from 2011 to 12 12 to 13 and 13 to 14 so on march 2000 in march 2014 the southeast asian region was declared polio free now let's take a look at the epidemiology of polio so as you see here this is the agent host and environmental triad epidemiological triad the agent is the polio virus which belongs to the picorna viridae family host is the infants and children under 3 years of age it is common in the preschool children males are more affected than the females and contaminated water food overcrowding other various factors which are responsible for the spread of this virus it's essentially the feco oral so the agent factor is the picorna virus which is the polio virus which belongs to the picorna family and the enterovirus group the smallest virus is found in nature there are three serotypes and type 1 which is a 90% cases are type 1 and type 2 which has been eliminated the last case in india was in 1999 and type 3 which has a greater temperature stability reservoir of infection is only man that is why polio has been uh, targeted for eradication because we have a very good vaccine live vaccine or pv and secondly man as acting as the only reservoir there are no other arthropod or animal or vertebrate reservoirs other than man so we can target the, it's better it's easier for uh, us to target it as for eradication the infectious material are the fecal and neuropharyngeal secretions of infected people Yes, the infectious material is the fecal and the oropharyngeal secretions of infected persons. Period of communicability is 7 to 10 days before and after the onset of symptoms. If in feces, the virus may be excreted as long as 3 to 4 months. Now, age. All age groups are susceptible all it can be seen in the adults also but the most common those who are affected or cases are seen in the age group of six months to five years the males are more commonly affected and the risk factors or the factors which can lead to or which can uh, start the sequelae and produce the paralysis such risk factors are fatigue trauma, intramuscular injection, operation during epidemics, and DPT vaccine. So if we, if we see that during the epidemics of polio, most of the operations among children were postponed. Operations like tonsillectomy, which were common in the children, these were not undertaken during the ongoing epidemic. Because any kind of trauma or injury to the muscles or it can precipitate the paralysis. Immunity. Maternal antibody protects up to first six months of life. And there is no cross immunity with other serotypes. So the three serotypes, each one will have its own immunity. Modes of transmission, as all of us already know, feco-oral route is the most important route of transmission. It spreads through the contaminated water and food and the virus is excreted in the feces of the child and once this if there is mixing of this feces if they are drinking water then it will reach the virus will get entry into the drinking water and then it will reach the newer hosts so the fecal route of transmission is important 
Uh, directly, it can also spread by contaminated fingers if hand washing practices are not followed. Indirectly, through the contaminated water, milk, blood, flies, and fomites. Droplet infection is a rare way of transmission. Then incubation period, it is 7 to 14 days. It can extend for up to 35 days before and after the onset of the symptoms. Now, what are the environmental factors? It is commonly seen during the rainy season from June to September. Overcrowding and poor sanitation are the factors which favor the spread of the disease. As we see here, if the drinking water supplies are not safe, if there is a mixing of sewage water and drinking water, then it will easily facilitate the spread of the virus. So poor sanitation and uh, people living in very close contact, very uh, crowded houses, then there is a faster spread of the disease. Now let's see the pathophysiology, how it infects and how it affects the host. So poliovirus, it infects the intestinal epithelium. So the so pathology, poliovirus infects the intestinal epithelium. There is a replication of virus in the epithelial cells. The virus reaches the pair's patches where it multiplies and from the pair's patches it reaches the lymphatic uh, glands uh, vessels and then from there to the blood causing viremia and the systemically it spreads to all the organs and there is a also there is a production of antibodies. The virus replicates in the oropharyngeal and intestinal mucosa, that is the elementary phase. Then the virus spreads to the tonsils and multiplies in the pears, patches and the cervical and the mesenteric lymph node, that is the lymphatic phase. Virus is absorbed in the bloodstream and it spreads to the internal organs and the lymph nodes. Poliovirus can survive and multiply within the blood and lymphatics for 17 weeks, viremic phase, neurogenic phase, virus spreads to the spinal cord. It affects the anterior motor horn cells and produces anterior horn cells and it produces paralysis. Now, what is the sequelae of the polio infection? Polio infection in around 91 to 96 percent cases, the infection is inapparent. There are no manifestations. There is no clinical features. There are no clinical features. And it, the infection, just the children get infected and they remain totally asymptomatic. Then in the five to 10 percent there is a clinical poliomyelitis or the poliomyelitis accompanied with symptoms. Among them again 4 to 8 percent have minor illness where it is called as abortive polio and only 1 percent have the major illness. Among those having major illness only less than 1 percent people suffer from paralytic polio while rest of them have non-paralytic polio. So what happens is, maximum have inapparent or subclinical infection, where there is no clinical manifestations. Infection is associated with acquiring immunity and it can also uh, re cause a reaching the carrier state, where the patient or the child is able to spread the virus but he himself remains asymptomatic. Then clinical poliomyelitis, the mild uh, illness, abortive polio which will show the signs of systemic manifestations for one to two days. Manifestations would be just like any viral fever. There would be fever, pharyngitis, sore throat 
vomiting, abdominal pain or diarrhea. Then in the major illness, which is seen only in 1 to 10 percent of cases, there is an involvement of CNS. It can be either the non-paralytic format polio or it can be paralytic. The non-paralytic polio is mainly seen in a like it appears like the signs and symptoms of meningitis where the patient gets fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, neck stiffness, stiffness in the back and limbs. The cases either recover fully or they can pass to the paralysis stage. Then paralytic poliomyelitis. Paralysis usually appears around 7 to 10 days from the onset of disease. Presented with fever, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, headache, sore throat, constipation, abdominal pain. It could be signs of meningeal irritation. Then uh, the patients may show the tripod sign that is difficulty in sitting and the patient sits by supporting his hands at the back and by partially flexing the hip and the knee. The tripod sign that the patient is taking the support of his hands to support his back. Different paralytic manifestations according to the part of the CNS involved. If the facial, if the cranial nerves are involved, then it leads to the bulbar paralysis. If the spinal nerves are involved in the spinal paralysis and if the combination of cranial and spinal nerves, it can produce bulbospinal manifestations. So destruction of the motor neurons present in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord and that is that it can lead to motor paralysis which is of the lower motor neuron type but it does not affect the sensory nerves. So spinal polio, different spinal nerves are involved with the injury of the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord causing the lower motor neuron type of weakness which is causes tenderness, weakness, flaccidity, then the lower limbs are most commonly affected and the paralysis is typically characterized as a descending type of paralysis where it starts at hip and then moves down to the distal parts of the extremity. It's an asymmetrical patchy paralysis. There is a variation in both the lower limbs. Lower limbs are most commonly affected. It is a distal paralysis from proximal to distal. Proximal muscles are more involved and in the muscles are involved in patches or in groups. So it is not symmetrical or it is asymmetrical in both the limbs. Then bulbar polio is the nuclear of the cranial nerves are involved which can cause the weakness of the supplied muscles and it may be encephalitis. Bulbar manifestations like dysphagia that is not able to be uh, deglutition is not possible, food is not able to swallow, nasal voice, nasal twang, fluid regurgitation from the nose, difficulty in chewing, facial weakness and diplopia. So because of the involvement of the facial muscles, the oculomotor nerve, the facial nerve and the tenth nerve, we find get to see these manifestations. Paralysis of muscle of respiration is the most serious life-threatening manifestation. And in the case of bulbospinal polio, it is the combination of both the spinal and the bulbar forms. Among the children who are paralyzed by polio, 30% make full recovery. 30% are left with mild paralysis. 30% have medium to severe paralysis and 10% people or children die because of the paralysis of the respiratory muscles. Complications and case fatality. The complications seen in polio are respiratory complications like pneumonia, pulmonary edema, cardiovascular complications like myocarditis or pulmonary or late complications like soft tissue and bone deformities, 
osteoporosis, chronic distension of colon, etc. Case fatality varies from 1 to 10 percent according to the type of disease, and a higher fatality is seen in the bulbar type of colon. Now, how do we diagnose and confirm the case of poliomyelitis? To rule out or confirm the diagnosis, we have to do virus isolation. That is the foremost investigation, most important one which we do. Poliovirus is isolated from the stool samples. Intermediate chances to get from pharyngeal swabs and very low chance that you will be able to isolate it from blood or spinal fluid. So most commonly what we do is the collect the stool samples. A fourfold titer rise between the acute and convalescent specimen suggests poliovirus infection. Virus isolation is from the highest from the stool samples. Then we can do the serological testing which shows a fourfold titer rise between acute and convalescent specimens suggesting poliovirus infection. CSF analysis, the cerebrospinal fluid usually contains an increased number of leukocytes from 10 to 200 cells per millimeter cube and mildly elevated protein from 40 to 50 milligram per 100 ml. There is no specific treatment of this disease since it's a viral disease. You have to take good nursing care of the children to minimize the prevent or prevent crippling. Physiotherapy needs to be initiated immediately. Cystokinase treatment was, has a historical importance. It can be asked in MCQs. Hot moisture packs are applied to the muscles in order to relieve the pain and spasm. So as you see here, the sister Kini, she belonged to Australia and uh, she advocated the use of hot packs to be applied over the affected limbs. This was a direct contrast to accepted medical practice of keeping the limbs still. So this is her method to drop the paralysis rate from 85. Specific protection in the form of passive immunization by human immunoglobulins is not used. We have active immunization where we have two vaccines, IPV that is the injectable polio vaccine and the oral polio vaccine. Now let's see the difference between these two vaccines. The oral polio vaccine was discovered by Sabin. It's also called a Sabin vaccine. It is a live attenuated vaccine and it is given as two drops and the immunity which is achieved through OPV is both humoral and intestinal. It induces the local antibody response in the intestines in the form of IgA antibodies. Then it prevents paralysis and it also prevents reinfection. It can be effectively used in controlling the epidemics and is very uh, cheap as compared to the IPV and easy to manufacture. In contrast, let's see the points for the SALC vaccine or the IPV vaccine. It's a killed and a formalized vaccine which is given subcutaneously or intramuscular. It induces circulating antibodies, but there is no development of any form of local immunity. It prevents paralysis, but does not prevent reinfection. It's not useful in controlling epidemics and more difficult to manufacture and is relatively costly. Then oral polio vaccine can be stored and transported at sub zero, sub -zero temperatures and is damaged easily. It's a very heat sensitive vaccine. OPV zero is given at birth or as early as possible. The schedule is given here. OPV0 is given at birth. OPV1, 2 and 3 at 6, 10 and 14 weeks. And OPV boosters are given at 1 and half years of age and 5 years of age. Then IPV, 
IPv does not require stringent conditions for storage and has a longer shelf life. It's not as heat sensitive as OPV. It is given on the 14th week and the antilateral thigh and uh, we all know that in our current immunization uh, schedule we give it fractional IPV is used which is given intradermal twice. Then OPV the other advantage is it's easy to administer it's just orally administered so it does not require a paramedical or a trained staff. Then IPV, the adverse reaction, the main, the most important adverse uh, event following OPV is the vaccine associated paralytic polio. And that is the main reason why we want to replace OPV with the IPV because there will always be the risk of uh, after giving polio vaccine, the vaccine virus may mutate in the gut of the recipient and can produce the vaccine associated paralytic polio. IPV is a safe vaccine, it's a killed vaccine, so there is no chance of the virus reverting back to its pathogenic form. It can be given to the patients who are immunocompromised, persons undergoing treatment on steroids or on radiation therapy, those over the age of 50 years who are receiving vaccine for the first time and during pregnancy. IPV can cause local pain and swelling. Uh, this is the difference between the IPV and the fractional IPV. We are using the FIPV in the, our current schedule. So FIPV, it is available. Uh, we give in the two doses at 6 and 14 weeks. While IPV was given a single dose at 14 weeks. FIPV is given intradermal and on the upper arm and 0.1 ml AD syringe. Two fractional doses of IPV given the four weeks produce a better immunogenicity than the single standard dose of So that is the reason we want to use the IPV instead of uh, OPV. What is the risk associated with the use of OPV? Vaccine associated paralytic polio. VAP is caused by a strain of polio virus that has genetically changed in the intestine from the original attenuated vaccine uh, strain containing the OPV. It's associated with a single dose of OPV administered in a child or can occur. It's associated with a single dose of OPV administered in a child or can occur in the close unvaccinated or non-immune contact of the vaccine recipients who are excreting the mutated virus. The risk of vaccine associated paralytic polio varies by the dose and virus setting. Another term we commonly see is the vaccine derived polio virus, VDPV. A vaccine derived polio virus is a very rare strain of polio virus genetically changed from the original strain contained in OPV mostly by type 3 strain followed by type 2 and type 1. Types of VDPV. So circulating vaccine derived polio virus. A CVDPV is associated with sustained person to person transmission and is circulating in the community under conditions of low population in the uh, IVDPV or the immune deficiency related vaccine derived polio virus reported in the immunodeficient patients who have prolonged infection after exposure to OPV. Then the AVDPV or the ambiguous vaccine derived polio virus currently have unclassified source that is single isolate from a healthy or a non immunodeficient person environmental isolates without an isolated AFP case. Among these three types, the CVDPV 
causes sustained circulation and due to this opv should be phased out uh, to secure the lasting polio free world so we have three types of uh, vaccine derived polio viruses the circulating vdpvs the immunodeficiency related vdpvs and the ambiguous type among these three the cvdpv is common and it causes sustained circulation and this is the hazard of using the live vaccine and that is why it is very necessary that we plan to phase out polio uh, vaccine opv vaccine and replace it with ipv vaccine to achieve the polio free world now as we all know that uh, polio has already been uh, we are almost all the countries have been declared polio free and we have a polio eradication and end game strategic plan 2018-13 to 18 on 26 may 2012 the world health assembly declared the completion of polio virus eradication to be a programmatic emergency for global health global public health and called for the development of comprehensive polio end game strategy in response to this directive the global polio eradication end game strategy was formed now there are four main uh, objectives to this polio end game strategy the first is the virus detection and interruption and interruption then second is the routine immunization strengthening and the opv withdrawal which had three steps first it was by the 2014 we had to introduce ipv then in 2016 we had to switch to bivalent opv and by the 18 we have to withdraw all the oral polio vaccine which were not done yet then containment and certification finalize the long term containment plans contain polio virus and certify the interpretation interruption of transmission then legacy planning consultation and mainstreaming the polio polio eradication infrastructure so the first step was the introduction of ipv in the routine immunization by october 2015 introduced at least one dose of ipv in the ri that is routine immunization and at least 6 months before the switch from topv to bopv topv to bopv switch by april 2016 switch from topv to bopv does not contain type 2 sabine virus that by variant opv in the routine immunization polio campaigns so we in the april of 2016 it was decided to switch from the use of trivalent to the use of bivalent opv then withdrawal of routine opv use plan for the eventual withdrawal of all opv in routine immunization by the year 2020 there are three distinct steps of polio end game strategy before the 2015 introduce at least one dose of ipv in routine immunization then in 2016 we have to switch from trivalent to bivalent opv and by the year 2020 withdraw the use of bivalent opv and routine opv use so let's see the details of the global switch withdrawal of the type 2 component of opv the primary objectives of switch are the successful recall of trivalent opv and introduction of bivalent opv in 2016 minimize the opv wastage ensure all children are vaccinated and validate that the country is free from the use of tpv what is the rationale for introduction of ipv into routine immunization the primary purpose of introducing ipv 
into routine immunization is to boost the population immunity against the type 2 polio virus during and after the planned global withdrawal of OPV2 and switch from TOPV to BOPV. So since the IPV contains all the three strains of the killed virus, it is very essential that we introduce IPV in the primary immunization after before we switch from trivalent to bivalent OPV so that the recipients or the children develop immunity against the type 2 polio virus. This is to reduce the VAP risks. IPV administration is recommended at 14 weeks of age because it provides the optimal balance between vaccine efficacy and early protection. If one dose of IPV is used, it should be given from 14 weeks because this is the age when maternal antibodies start diminishing and immunogenicity is significantly higher. Now we come to the next strategy which is being used that is the AFP surveillance. Nationwide acute flaccid paralysis surveillance is the gold standard for detecting cases of poliomyelitis. Surveillance identifies new cases and detects the importation of wild polio virus. There are four steps of surveillance. First is finding and reporting children with acute flaccid paralysis. Second step is transporting the stool samples for analysis. Third is isolating and identifying the polio virus in the lab. And lastly, mapping the virus to determine its origin. So these are the four steps. First is a robust uh, flaccid paralysis surveillance, finding the children under the 15 years of age who have flaccid paralysis, then transporting the stool samples, then isolating the virus and identifying its type, and lastly, mapping of the virus. The healthcare staff must promptly report every case of acute flaccid paralysis in any child under the age of 15. Number of AFP cases reported each year is used as an indicator of the country's ability to detect polio even in countries where the disease no longer exists. So even if there is no uh, single case of polio detected in India, we still continue with the surveillance program and so that we do not miss out any case and it is a good indicator of our surveillance system. A country surveillance system needs to be sensitive enough to detect at least one case of AFP per one lakh children below 15 years even in the absence of wild polio virus transmission. So this AFP case needs to be detected the AFP can be because of any other cause other than polio. It can be Levi's syndrome. It could be transverse myelitis, traumatic myelitis. So the various differential diagnoses are available. But the surveillance system need to identify at least one AFP case per one lakh population. Then what we do is transport the stool samples for analysis. So all the AFP cases should be reported and tested for wild polio virus. Fecal specimen are analyzed for the presence of polio because shedding of the virus is variable. Two specimens which are taken 24 to 48 hours apart are required. Stool specimens have to be sealed in containers and stored immediately inside a refrigerator or a pack between the uh, pack between the frozen ice packs at 4 to 8 degrees Celsius and the specimen should reach the lab within 72 hours of collection. So this is called as the reverse cold chain where the stool samples are sealed in the containers and transported in cold chain to the polio labs. If polio virus is isolated, the next step is to distinguish between wild and vaccine associated virus. If wild polio virus is isolated, then we have to identify which of the two surviving serotypes 
the wild virus is involved. Once wild polio virus has been identified, further tests are carried out to determine whether the strain or from where the strain has originated. When polio has been pinpointed to a precise geographical area, it is possible to identify the source of import importation of polio virus, whether it is a cross-border uh, importation or from the same country. Along with AFP surveillance, we also carry out the environmental surveillance that involves testing the sewage or other environmental samples. Mm -hmm. Environmental surveillance involves testing the sewage or other environmental sample for presence of polio virus. Environmental surveillance often confirms wild polio virus infection in absence of cases of paralysis. Systematic environmental sampling provides important supplementary surveillance data. So the line listing of cases started in the year 1989 to look for uh, duplication, year of onset of illness to screen the children with residual paralysis who developed poliomyelitis prior to the year of reporting, identification of high risk pockets and documentation of high risk age groups. Line listing of cases made it possible to take appropriate actions in areas from where cases have been reported, providing useful epidemiological data for program Mopping up. This activity is last in polio eradication. Mopping up involves door-to-door -door immunization in high-risk districts where wild polio virus is known or suspected to be still circulating. So mop-up is the last activity in polio eradication campaign where we uh, undertake door-to-door -door surveys in the high-risk districts and wherever suspected transmission is there, we boost the immunization by carrying out ring immunization in that area. Now we come to the fourth important point in eradication. The first was routine immunization. The second was the switch, the third was the AFP surveillance and fourth pillar of eradication is the pulse polio immunization program. In India, the national immunization days have become the largest public health campaign ever conducted in a single country. The government of India conducted the first round of PPI consisting of two immunization days six weeks apart on 9th December 1995 and on 28th January 1996. It targeted all the children up to three years. Later on, WHO increased the age up to five years. The term pulse has been added to describe this sudden simultaneous mass administration of OPV on a single day to all the children of 0 to 5 years of age regardless to previous immunization. PPI occurs in two rounds about 4 to 6 weeks apart during the low transmission season of polio that is between November to February. These doses are extra doses which supplement and do not replace the doses received during immunization services. There is no minimum interval between the PPI and the scheduled OPV doses. So the Pulse Polio campaign has been active since 1995 and it includes giving all the children under 5 years of age on the same day a single dose of mass administration of the oral polio vaccine. Once we give the oral polio on such a large scale to around 2.5 to 3 crore children. The main aim is to replace the wild polio virus present in the intestine by the vaccine virus. With this, we are trying to improve or trying to build up the herd immunity amongst the population against the wild polio virus. 
entire wild polio shedding of wild polio virus stops and all the children will start shedding the uh, polio vaccine virus which is a live vaccine and hence the vaccine virus multiplies in the gut of the children so this used to be take place for uh, twice two doses in one year in the national rounds and in a certain area where the transmission is very high we used to do the uh, similar uh, in the sub national rounds in up and in the bihar in certain such states where there is a high risk of transmission sub national rounds were also conducted there are some controversies related to the vaccine contaminated polio vaccine uh, causing contamination in the vaccine so these are mostly the uh, reported cases are of the vaccine derived polio virus and if those are these are not the wild polio virus cases so that's all about the polio eradication strategy and i hope fully we eradicate this from the world very soon thank you